Hi everyone, my name is Sherif and today we will discuss our work Dense Dynamic Blocks Optimizing SPMM for Processors with Vector and Matrix Units. This work is done with collaboration between people from UIUC and IBM Research. New processors now feature matrix multiply units that are successfully utilized for dense matrix multiply operations, especially in machine learning domain. For example, IBM Power 10, our target system in this work, offers matrix multiply assist instructions. These new matrix multiply units create a functional unit rich environment. Although these matrix units successfully speed up dense matrix multiplications, special attention is required for sparse matrix primitives. In this work, we consider one such sparse matrix primitive, sparse matrix dense matrix multiplication, SPMM. SPMM is the main building block for many complex applications from linear solvers to graph neural networks. Furthermore, these applications are iterative, executing SPMM many times. Therefore, SPMM consumes the many of the application's execution cycles. However, the sparse matrices have irregular and unpredictable sparsity patterns. This irregularity makes it hard to utilize the matrix multiply hardware efficiently. In our work, we propose mechanisms to utilize these new matrix multiply units for SPMM. To address these challenges, in this work, we propose dense dynamic blocks, which can utilize matrix and vector units synergistically to maximize the floating point throughput. However, not all matrices can actually perform well by utilizing the matrix multiply hardware. For this reason, we also propose a performance prediction tool that is capable of selecting the functional unit, register reuse, and cache optimization strategies. In this talk, we will first briefly discuss the details of Power 10 Matrix Multiply Assist facilities. Then, we will discuss our dense dynamic blocks approach and explain our machine learning based optimizer. And finally, we will conclude our discussion. Let's start with MMA units operation. MMA units provide small outer product instructions that can be utilized to build larger but still small dense matrix multiply operations. Specifically, MMA provides 4x2 double precision and 4x4 single precision outer product operations. It also provides 8 4x2 and 8 4x4 accumulators for double and single precision values respectively to accumulate the results of multiple outer product operations. As an example, we show how we can multiply two 4x4 double precision matrices. In this example, we use two 4x2 accumulators, one shown with solid line borders, while the other is shown with dashed line borders. The first matrix A is stored in column major order, while the second matrix B is in row major order. A column of A is multiplied by a row of B, by using two 4x2 other product instructions. Each operation generates a 4x2 matrix and written to a different accumulator. Note that since our outer product operations are 4x2, the row of B should be divided in half. Then this outer product instruction is repeated for all columns of A and all rows of B. Note that the columns of A and rows of B that are multiplied with each other are shown with the same color. The resulting matrix is 4x4 and obtained in row major order. After seeing how the MMA operates, our first, is, first instinct is to block the sparse matrix to build small R by C blocks that can be mapped to small dense matrix multiply operations implemented with MMA instructions. However, this is a challenging task since these R by C blocks are hard to obtain and they may introduce a lot of zero padding. And as we, will, as we will see later, this may cause the underutilization of matrix multiply units. As a result, we propose a more flexible approach, dense dynamic blocks, DDB. Our DDB method forms dynamically sized blocks from R by one blocks to utilize the MMA units more efficiently. Additionally, 
DDB can also detect the inefficient execution points and switch to utilizing vector units if needed. Let's consider an example of how DDB improves the performance. First, let's try to create 4x4 blocks from the example matrix shown on the left. This matrix is a 4x8 sparse matrix, where the non-zero elements are marked with different letters. Using 4x4 blocks, we obtain two separate blocks as seen on the right. This approach introduces a lot of non-zero padding. There are many 4x1 blocks, columns to be specific, that are completely zero, shown with white background. At the end, such an approach needs to execute 128 floating point operations when only 40 floating point operations are needed. Instead, in DDB, we eliminate the need for creating rectangular RBC blocks formed by consecutive columns. In DDB, we search for non-empty 4x1 blocks and pack them together to form larger rectangular blocks, irrespective of whether they come from consecutive columns of the sparse matrix or not. This allows us to get a 38% reduction with respect to initial 4x4 blocking. Although such dynamic approach is beneficial, eliminating many zero columns, it is not perfect. For example, in our toy matrix, we still do two times more work, specifically due to the columns with few non-zeros. Let's take a closer look at this problem. When we are processing blocks with different zero paddings with MMA outer product instructions, the effective floating point throughput, which is the amount of useful work we can complete in a single cycle varies. The MMA units can execute 32 floating point operations per cycle. When we have all four elements as non-zeros, we can utilize all of this throughput. However, with increasing amounts of zero padding, our effective throughput goes down. For example, blocks with three, two, or one non-zeros can obtain 24, 16, and eight floating point operation per cycle effective throughput by utilizing the MMA units. On the other hand, in IBM Power 10, the throughput of vector instructions is 16 floating point operations per cycle. Note that with vector instructions, we only need to process the non-zero elements in the blocks. In the example where we have white squares, we don't need to perform any floating point operations. For yellow and red blocks, utilizing MMA units always makes sense because vector instructions will not be able to achieve the same throughput. With the blue blocks, vector and MMA instructions would achieve the same throughput. Especially when we have a single non-zero in a block, the effective throughput of eight floating point operations per cycle is lower than what we could do in power 10 with vector instructions. With the gray block, Using vector instructions can in fact improve the performance. Therefore, we also propose a more flexible version of DDB, DDB hybrid, that can utilize vector units when needed. In DDB hybrid mode, we separate the 4x1 blocks that would benefit from using MMA instructions from blocks with single non-zeros. The dentistry blocks are packed together to be executed in MMA units while blocks with a single non-zero are stored in compressed format to be processed by the vector units. In this hybrid mode, we only perform 44 floating point operations for the 40 floating point operations needed, while also achieving high floating point throughput on IBM Power 10. We put our techniques to test on a Power 10 machine with 30 SMT4 cores. We test 440 sparse matrices from well-known Swiss sparse matrix collection and test dense matrices with 16 to 256 columns. On the right-hand side, we show the distribution of the highest floating point throughput that we could achieve for each sparse matrix. For readability, we only show a subset of 440 matrices. The x-axis shows the gigaflows per second buckets and the 
y-axis shows the number of matrices in the corresponding bucket. Additionally, we also provide the breakdown of the methods CSR, DDB-MM, and DDB-Hybrid, in which we were able to get the highest throughput for each matrix. We observed that by using DDB-Hybrid and DDB-MM, shown with the white and gray bars, we can achieve up to 1.15 teraflops per second for double precision and 2.5 teraflops per second for single precision SPMMs. When we consider all 440 matrices in double precision experiments, we see that 247 of the matrices achieves the fastest performance with DDB hybrid. And for single precision, 211 of the matrices achieves the highest throughput with DDB MM method. In addition to the dense dynamic blocks method, we also consider optimizations for improving register reuse and cache locality. Specifically, we consider optimizations for improving register reuse for sparse matrix A and dense matrix C. Both of these register reuse optimizations are applicable for blocked portion of the sparse matrix that is processed on MMA units and also the compressed portion of the sparse matrix that is processed on vector units. For the compressed portion, we call these CSRA and CSRC versions. And for the blocked portion, we call these optimizations MMAA and MMAC versions. Furthermore, we also consider how to optimize for cache locality. For this purpose, we employ cache slicing, which processes C equals A times B in multiple phases. For example, a dense matrix with 64 columns will be processed in four passes if it is sliced into 16 column slices. Further details can be found in the paper about these optimizations. When we take all the optimizations into account, the search space for an efficient SPM implementation becomes very large. First, we need to choose which functional unit to use. For this choice, on one end of the spectrum, we have a CSR-based implementation that can only utilize the vector units. On the other end, there is DDBMM, which only utilizes the MMA units, while the DDB hybrid is in between. Adding the register reuse approaches increases the complexity further. For both CSR and DDBMM, we introduce two more implementations to choose from. On the other hand, in DDB hybrid, we have a blocked and a compressed portion of the sparse matrix with both MMAA and MMAC and CSRA and CSRC, we have four different implementations. Finally, the case slicing is applicable to all CSR, DDBMM and DDB hybrid methods. In our work, we consider dense matrices with 16, 32, 64, 128, and 256 columns. In each case, any column number that is smaller than the number of columns in the input dense matrix is a candidate for the slicing parameter. Our SPM optimizer needs to select a fast execution strategy in this complex search space. To navigate this complex search space, we use a machine learning based approach, which we name as SPMM Optimizer. SPMM Optimizer has three components. First, we design a mechanism to detect the potential for getting benefits from utilizing MMA units. To this end, we design average floating point throughput metric. With AFT, we categorize the sparse matrices into low and high potential matrices. Second, SPMM Optimizer has a novel feature set to summarize the matrix characteristics in terms of size, locality, and blocking characteristics of the sparse matrix. And finally, we train separate machine learning models for high and low potential matrices with different number of columns in the dense matrices. For example, in our work, we train 10 different models since we have 16 to 256 column dense matrices. And each of our ML models use support vector machines with linear kernel.
Let's first discuss AFT. AFT calculates the potential to effectively utilize the MMA units for a given matrix. With AFT, we answer the question, what would be the average floating point throughput of this sparse matrix? By using the AFT, we break down the matrices into high and low potential groups with an experimentally selected threshold value of 20. Specifically, AFT estimates the average floating point throughput per non-zero. To calculate AFT, we first find the distribution of non-zeros to 4 by 1 blocks with different density levels. The distribution H. In H, every element HI gives us the fraction of non-zeros in a block with I non-zeros. Let's consider the example on the left. In this case, we have only a single block that is completely filled with non-zeros. In this case, we have four elements that reside in a block with four non-zeros. Therefore, four out of 10 non-zeros are in H4 entry. Next, we consider the blocks with density level three. In this case, again, we have only a single block, the yellow one, that has three non-zeros in it. So the H3 entry is three over 10. We don't have any examples with two A blocks with two non-zeros in it. Therefore, H2 entry is zero. And finally, there are three blocks with a single non-zero element in them. Therefore, three out of 10 non-zeros reside in a block with one non-zero. And H1 becomes three over 10. Secondly, we consider the effective throughput of blocks with I non-zeros the T distribution. Remember that the effective throughput of a given 4x1 block depends on the number of non-zeros in the block. With MMA units, we can obtain 32, 24, 16 floating point operations per cycles for blocks with 4, 3, and 2 non-zeros respectively. And for blocks with a single non-zero, we can use the vector units to obtain 16 floating point operations per cycle throughput. Therefore, T4, T3, T2, and T1 entries of the T distribution are 32, 24, 16, and 16 respectively. Finally, by summing up the products of H and T distributions corresponding entries, we calculate the AFT matrix. For example, the AFT value of our example matrix is 24.8. Therefore, this is a high potential matrix. The second component of the SPML optimizer is the features that we use as the inputs of our machine learning models. These features can be categorized under three groups, size, blocking, and locality characteristics. With size characteristics, we consider simple properties of the sparse matrix, such as the number of rows and the number of non-zeros. With blocking characteristics, we consider the distribution of non-zeros to the 4 by one blocks that are created, as we have done while calculating AFT. And finally, with locality characteristics, we create features that analyze the memory access behavior of 4 by one blocks created and the memory access characteristics for portions of the sparse matrix assigned to a single thread. The intuition behind these features are as follows. Size characteristics gives us insights into the amount of work need to be performed by SVMM. With blocking characteristics, we gain insights into how effective MMA can be. And with locality characteristics, we gain insights into the effectiveness of slicing. To summarize, SPM optimizer works as follows. First, we need to calculate the AFT metric for a given sparse matrix. If AFT value is found to be larger than our threshold, then the matrix is a high potential. Note that the high potential and low potential matrices have separate sets of machine learning models to predict the best SPMM strategy. Let's say in our example, the AFT value is higher than 20 and our matrix is high potential. Therefore, we will use one of the machine learning models on the top. In the second step, we calculate the matrix features and feed those features to the corresponding 
machine learning model that we have. In this example, let's assume that the dense matrices that we have have 64 columns. Therefore, the matrix features that are calculated are fed into the high potential 64 column dense matrix machine learning models. This machine learning model is going to tell us what functional unit strategy to use, what kind of register reusing strategy that we want to use, and what is the appropriate slicing parameter. In practice, we combine the functional unit strategy with the register reuse strategy and show them as separate implementations. Therefore, the machine learning model in step three will choose one of the implementations that are shown in the white boxes. Furthermore, since we have 64 columns in our dense matrix, there are only three slicing parameters that are appropriate in this case, 16, 32, and 64. Furthermore, the machine learning model will also choose the best slicing parameter for this specific sparse matrix. To test the effectiveness of SPMM optimizer, we compared against an Oracle implementation. The Oracle selects the fastest strategy among all functional unit, register reuse, and slicing strategies. First, we consider the matrices in the high potential group. The figures show the distribution of speed ups that we obtain with respect to a hand optimized CSR baseline without any case slicing. The figures are for double precision SPMM, where we have 64 columns in the dense matrices. The figure on left shows the results for the SPMM optimizer, while the figure on the right shows the results for the Oracle. As before, we also show the breakdown of the highest performing methods. For high potential matrices, we observe that the average speedup is 1.55x, while the Oracle can achieve an average speedup of 1.76x. For these matrices, as expected, the speedup generally comes from selecting DDB hybrid and DDB MM methods with proper slicing parameters. When we consider the low potential matrices, we observe that SPMO optimizer can achieve an average speedup of 1.3x, while the Oracle can deliver an average speedup 1.64x. As we see in the figures, many matrices get their best performance with CSR. Although not shown in these figures, in this case, the key to the high performance is selecting the proper slicing parameter. In this presentation, we omitted many details due to time limits. The detailed descriptions of our optimizations, DDB and SPMM optimizer, the experiments with 16 to 256 column dense matrices, and a discussion on the effect of slicing can be found in the paper. To conclude, in this work, we have proposed mechanisms to optimize SPMM on processors with vectors and matrix units. First, we propose dense dynamic blocks, a hybrid approach to utilize vector and matrix units together for SPMM. We observe that our method DDB can achieve up to 1.1 teraflops per second for double precision and 2.5 teraflops per second for single precision SPMM. Next, we presented SPMM optimizer. SPMM optimizer is a machine learning method to navigate the optimization search space for SPMM, considering functional unit, register reuse, and cache slicing strategies. We observe that SPMM optimizer can achieve an average speed up of up to 2x compared to an optimized CSR baseline. And with this, we conclude our presentation. Thank you for your time. We are looking forward to your questions.